I'm Linda Cavanaugh, and I had the pleasure of interning at WKY TV in 1973. I just graduated from the University of Oklahoma, and I had a fairly extensive print background. I'd worked for Red Book Magazine in New York, United Press International, The Daily Oklahoman, The Oklahoma City Times, and of course, for the student newspaper. And I, it just occurred to me, you know, I've never really tried television. It never even occurred to me to do it because back then there really weren't that many women in television. So it wasn't a, a field you aspired to go into so much because the, you had some role model that you were watching. So I drove up there and I went into the newsroom and I talked to Jack Ogle, who was the news director. And I said, you know, I think I'd like a job in television. He looked at me, he said, you know, the problem is you don't have any experience. And I said, you know, but if nobody hires me, I won't get any. And so he said, can't hire you without any experience, but he said, but you're welcome just to kind of stick around and go out with the crews and learn what you can and, and see what you think of the industry. So that's what I did. I had graduated from the University of Oklahoma. I was living at home, and so every morning I'd just go up, get up and go out to WKY and uh, just kind of hang around to see how things were done. And it was such a wonderful, priceless experience because I was really with the pioneers of television. It was not as though they had a book to read to know how to do it. They wrote the book. If a situation came up that they didn't know how to do, they got the engineers and the photographers and the reporters together and they figured out a way to do it. And it was remarkable because I didn't have to break any bad habits because I had no habits. I simply had to imitate the geniuses that I had the pleasure to be around. I can remember, for instance, and you have to remember, this was back a few decades ago, you didn't have live television like we have now. You didn't have the satellite feeds. So in order to get a story from one place to another, and it was on film at the time, 16 millimeter film, the way they do it would be special delivery via airplane. Ernie Schultz, the news director at the time, was a pilot. And if we were doing a story outside of the Oklahoma City area or someplace else in the state, they'd go do the story. Ernie would fly up there, pick up the canisters, and then he would fly back to the television station and his wife, Teddy, had sewn together this contraption that had some type of padding in it. So he would put the film in this package and he would fly over the station and drop it in a field. And then the, the reporter or somebody would go out there and pick it up and bring it in for the film to be processed. And that was the way we got long distance news on the air as quickly as we could. And during this internship, I learned about how television news should be done. I mean, the great people were there. Ernie Schultz was the news director. Uh, Daryl Barton was a chief photographer, brilliant photographer. And the people that I was surrounded by just kind of gave you a, a, a feeling of what it was to be the best in the business. And Channel 4, in many respects, WKY, led the way. So it was just an intriguing and, and wonderful place to be because you never knew what they were gonna attempt to do next. They wrote the book on television and it was just so much fun to be there and to be part of that, even as an intern, even as a person just kind of watching on the sidelines. And so I would go out with the crews, I'd watch what they did. And in doing that, learned how to write copy, learned how to shoot film, learned how to, to be a television journalist while I was just watching them. I eventually married my husband, Will Clark, who was getting his PhD at the University of Virginia, and I went out there and I was on television for a while. And when I returned, I returned to Channel 4 and was so happy to be hired by them. I mean, it was just, it was the dream of a lifetime. Because as a little girl, I can remember waking up in the morning on my grandparents' farm south of Norman, and the people you'd see would be Russell Pearson and Bob Berry and Jack Ogle and Ernie Schultz. And here I was having the privilege of working alongside these people that, you know, you've seen in this box for so long, you don't really consider them human, something supernatural or something. And here I am working day, day to day with them. And it was just the most pleasurable, wonderful experience because they were great guys. Uh, Bob Berry Sr., of course, one of my favorites. Uh, always had a great sense of humor, never took himself seriously, and when he did sports, he wanted it to be about the, the games people played. He didn't care about all these, you know, crimes being committed by, he thought that was news. All he wanted to talk about were the games. And I can remember one time we were up in Kansas City, and we were up there covering OSU. I think they were in the final four. 
and Bob at the time was doing radio and he would have this briefcase that he would carry his broadcast gear in and he, he literally just had to plug it in someplace and he would broadcast using that. So he went up there and he broadcast the OSU game because he was the voice of the Cowboys at the time. And when the game was over, he packed up all of his stuff and he left and he went out to the parking lot to find his rented car. He was at Kemper Arena. And so he looks around the parking lot and it occurs to him he has no clue where that car is. Doesn't have a clue what color the car is. And so this is how I learned how Bob looked at life. Instead of getting upset, he went back into the arena. He went by the concession stand, bought three or four hot dogs, and went up to the top of the, of the arena and sat and he watched the next three games from start to finish. And then when it was over, he watched them come in and start cleaning out the arena. And it was at that point that he walked back out into the parking lot and he took the keys to the car, the rental car, and he put them in the 20 different cars that were left in the parking lot and found his and went home. But that was just the way he was. You know, things didn't upset him. He found a good way to, to make something out of what other people would have considered a bad situation. And of course, we had the pleasure of doing football predictions together. We had so much fun doing that. And I have to be very honest with you. I think before he was doing with Jack Ogle, it was a very serious thing that they took seriously because here were two guys who were the voice of the OU Sooners and, and quite a broadcasting team. So when they would predict football games, people took them seriously. Well. Jack Ogle left, and so Bob asked if I'd like to do football predictions with him. And I think really the reason he asked is because he didn't think that I would win, because I knew nothing about football. And so we started doing these football predictions, and Bob would be very serious, and he'd tell you the viewers why he was picking a particular team based on how they played the week before and how they played, and the coach and the quarterback and this and that. And I would just out of the air pick a team. And by the end of the season, I was beating him from, I think I had about 80% correct and he had about 40. And so that kind of started the tradition of football predictions. And we'd try to make them fun. I remember one time uh, we brought on a gorilla and I kind of surprised Bob. The premise being that even a monkey could beat Bob at football predictions. And so they brought the gorilla out, little baby thing, and put it on the set. And it wasn't on the set probably 20, 30 seconds before it bit Bob on the thumb. And the zoo people came running on the set and they said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, tetanus shot. And Bob said, do I need to get the tetanus shot today? And they said, we're not talking about you, we're talking about the gorilla. We're worried about him getting something from you. And Bob's face just fell, you know, a little bit insulted, I think, to think that their concern was about the gorilla and not him. You know, back when I was there as an intern at WKY, and then when I was employed at KTVY, we didn't have teleprompters to begin with. And so, since most of the anchors wrote their own copy and produced the shows, you were generally familiar with what was supposed to be said. But I can remember the story about Jack Ogle, who was just a supreme broadcaster. He had this one copy of scripts in his hand and went into the bathroom right before the newscast and unfortunately dropped all of the scripts in the urinal. So he was kind of winging the whole thing throughout that newscast because he didn't really have much to go with and he didn't even have a teleprompter at that point. So that's when you really knew who was good and who knew the news that they were talking about because they had it in their mind and they could deliver it without any type of, of paper in front of them. And the delivery of the news back then was kind of fascinating just in the way that we, we had to get it. You know, back in, this would have been the late 70s, early 80s. The way we got a story to and from Tulsa, if you were shooting a story in Tulsa and you had film that you wanted to share with our Tulsa station, what we'd do is we'd take the canister of film and we'd stand outside the Turner Turnpike uh, gates, of course they were attended gates at the time, and when a car came up, we'd approach the driver and say, you know, this is news film, we really need to get it to Tulsa, would you drive it up there and just leave it at the gate? And then the Tulsa station would wait at the gate up there in Tulsa and then pick up the canister. And I promise you, doing this hundreds of times, we probably only lost three or four canisters of film because people were very diligent about dropping it off. Sometimes they'd forget and they'd call us and we'd get a, make arrangements for it to be delivered in Tulsa, but people were very, very responsible about getting that tape either to Oklahoma City or to Tulsa, depending on which direction it was going. Keep in mind we were shooting film, and so you would load film into the camera and you would just know that it was there. When our stories did make it to air, it was, it was kind of hectic at the last minute because with film, 
when we had sound on the film, there was a little magnetic strip that the sound was on. And so you would have to have the film developed and then you would put it through something called a magnesink, which moved the position of the magnetic tape so that it matched the lips. And then you'd edit the, edit the tape, the, I'm sorry, the film, and then you'd have to put it back through the magnesink so that it would put the sound where it needed to be so it went through the projector and matched the lips. And it was all a very uh, time-consuming thing. So oftentimes, you'd be back there trying to splice this film together so that you had time to put it through the magnus sink so you could run it up to the front to get it on the projector so that it would air. So thinking back to those times and the situations where we have now where everything is live and you have Twitter and you have you know, people broadcasting things before the regular media gets a hold of it. It's just a fascinating change in mass communications. You know, when you worked at Channel 4, you did everything. You were a one-man band. You, you had to take your own uh, film, and then you had to come back and edit. You had to write it and get it on the air. And I can remember there was controversy at the time because a lot of the guys in the newsroom didn't want females there. I was not the first female in the newsroom. Pam Henry was. But it was a big deal to have females in the newsroom because they would argue, well, you know, they can't carry the equipment. It was okay for a woman, I guess, to carry a 40-pound baby around, but, you know, to carry 40 pounds of equipment, I guess they thought was somehow different. But uh, women finally made their way into the newsroom thanks to some pioneers like Pam Henry and folks like that. And I was always fascinated by shooting the film. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Television news combined every one of my passions in one great, big, wonderful present. And that was writing and photography and meeting people and traveling. So I was just in hog heaven doing all of this. And I can remember the first story I shot on film. You know, I got some brief lessons from Daryl Barton and some of the folks there, and then they sent me out with this camera. And the first cameras we had were Bell & Howe 16 millimeters and just for the most part black and white and then of course they had color and uh, I went out and shot this um, story about this guy who refinished telephones these old uh, telephones that you would see on the wall you know the kind of with the you'd speak into this wall uh, device and hold the thing up to your ear and he was refinishing them and so that was the story and I loved it it was the first story I'd ever done and to uh, shoot it and then come back and have the guys look at it and go through it and tell you how you could improve. And it was really, when they explained it, it was just so simple that, you know, you start with a wide shot, then you get close-ups and you get medium shots, and you match the action so that, so that the person who's watching your film feels as though he or she is there. And I think that was one of the best things that I ever learned about television news was how important the visuals were. It separated television from radio. And if you had the visuals, you had the story. And I think that that throughout my 34 year career so far, far is the, the principal rule I follow that you have to have the video to make viewers interested in the story.